All right, so in John 15, we can read this on the screen. Jesus said, Abide in me, I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. It's a well-known verse. And as it abides in me, neither can you. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in, in them, him, will bear much fruit. Without me, you can do nothing. So abiding and praying is uh, more than just a, well, the best thing it is, is a means of relationship, of, of, of communing with our God. Uh, but it's also a means to fruitfulness. Jesus went on and said that. So it's good that we, uh, we, we bear fruit. John uh, 15 verse 8 says this, by, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. Have you ever thought about how God is glorified? Um, the old Westminster Catechism uh, and the old church says this, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And so we say, yes, that sounds good, but how do you glorify God? How do we bring glory to our God? God is glorified when we bring forth fruit. Singing is great. Shouting is great. Uh, you know, uh, praising God is great. And it's all brings some praise and honor. Uh, absolutely. But the fruit, in fact, that's probably fruit. Uh, but uh, the thing that glorifies God, the bottom line is it has to be some fruit. And so we want to talk about this and see how important fruit is to Jesus. Do you know that Jesus has a thing about fruit? And it seems like when you read through the Bible, he's always talking about fruit. He's talking about olive trees, fruit trees. He sees an olive tree, a fig tree over there. It's got no fruit. And then he says, here's a fruit a tree that's not bringing forth fruit. So, you know, dung it for three years. And then he's talking about uh, harvest fields and he's talking about grain fields. and He's talking about vines. I mean, you know, he's, he's the ultimate gardener. He is the gardener. And so he's all into fruit. In fact, right from the beginning, he says in Genesis to Adam, as he's uh, created him, he says, now you, I've made you in my image. Now what you've got to do is bring forth fruit. Multiply more of my image. And so what God is doing today, the Bible says in James, that the husband is waiting for the precious fruit of the earth. What he's waiting for is for the people of God to multiply the image of God in the earth. That's why it says in Numbers, for as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of God. So God's plan is that all the earth will be filled with his glory. What's that? Some shining gold, gold mist? No, it's the image of Jesus. It's the likeness of Christ. It's the, it's, a, it's the image, the nature, the power and the authority of Christ filling the earth through a multitude of people, the harvest that God is waiting for. Four. So God has, uh, he's, uh, he's the husbandman and he's waiting for the precious fruit of the earth to come in the last days with the outpouring of the latter and the former rain. A different story, you know all about that. But when Jesus was upon the earth, he was always telling parables about fruit and looking for fruit and, and, then, and, then, and then Adam. But uh, even, even Israel uh, was all about bearing fruit. Uh, in fact, he says, go into the promised land, the inheritance, and there they had grapes like this, and they were huge fruit. And it was a fruitful land. That was the whole point. A, a land that God had blessed to be fruitful. And when you get there, fruit is even going to increase. It's going to multiply. But the inheritance that Israel enjoyed was just a type. It was a picture of the church. As we enter into our inheritance, as we enter and possess our promised land, which Ephesians tells us Christ, he's our inheritance. He has an inheritance in us. We have an inheritance in him. But as we possess and pursue after our inheritance in Christ, the whole plan is that we produce some fruit. Did you get that down, kids? Okay. Are we up to 10 already? Are we up to 10? And so, uh, and so, uh, and, and so we're meant to be producing much fruit fruit. And then, of course, when in the Song of Solomon, we're just working through the Bible, but in the Song of Solomon, Jesus is uh, the bridegroom uh, as well as the gardener. And, and what he says about the, bride, uh, about the bride is quite cool. He says this, Song of Solomon 14, 12, as the bridegroom is looking at the bride, he says this, a garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Your plants are an orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits. And so it doesn't matter where you look, we get the picture that Jesus is really into fruit. He's looking for fruit. And so in Matthew 7, when he comes, he tells this parable, he tells this story. Uh, in Matthew 7, he said, even so, every good tree bears fruit, good fruit, and every bad tree bears bad fruit. And that's two more kids. <laughs> a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. So if you're going to make the tree good, is the only way to get good fruit. If the tree's bad, you're only ever going to get bad fruit. The point of a story is this. You can't change what a tree is. If it's bad, it's going to produce bad fruit. If it's good, it can produce good fruit. But the problem is nobody is a good tree. That's the problem. So Jesus solves the problem by becoming 
the new root. Now, every tree has fruit, has a branch, and then at the bottom it has roots, of course. And the roots are the more important part, because if you chop off the fruit, it's still an orange tree. And even if you chop the orange tree off, it's still got orange roots. And so if you let it grow, out of the roots will come an orange tree, and then out of the tree will come orange fruit. So the power is in the root. So the only way to change a tree to become good is to give it good roots. So Jesus does this. He is the good vine, he's the true bread, he's the true prophet, the true vine, the true root. And Isaiah 11:10 says this, that he's the, called the root of Jesse, in other places, the root of David. In other words, Jesus has become the root, the new root, uh, for all the believers uh, in, this messi- in this tree of, uh, of believers in the Messiah, the olive tree. But Jesus has become the root. And so if you can get the new root into your life, you can become a new tree and then you can produce the new fruit. And so Jesus is our new root. And that's why it says in Ephesians that Christ dwells in our hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. So that we're rooted in the love of Christ. We're gro- rooted in Christ. And because Jesus is the new root, we can produce new fruit. Does everybody say amen? amen. So that's uh, okay up till now. So we become trees of righteousness and able to produce the fruit of righteousness. But, and here's my point this morning, but there is something which can hinder us, I'm praying it's not, hinder us from producing the fruit that Christ is seeking to produce in our life. It's called offense. In Philippians, it says this, I pray that your love would abound more and more in knowledge and discernment, that you might approve the things that are excellent. That's number one. You'll, fruit's very difficult without that. Because what you do when you're approving things that are excellent, you're approving the thing God is doing in your life. Good, what you might think is good or bad, but you have to approve it. And, and, that you might, and if you don't, if you do, that you might be sincere and without offense, till the day, filled with the fruits of righteousness. So here's the thing. If offense ends into your life and into my life, it hinders, it, 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 it can even destroy the fruit of Christ that he's growing in our life. We have to deal with the thing of offense or bitterness. And so that's why it says in Ephesians 12, it says, looking diligently, looking carefully. It means really, really think about this. Look, lest anybody fall short of the grace and lest any root of bitterness spring up in the heart and defile us. You know, it's impossible to produce fruit when there's bitterness in our life. You cannot have love without bitterness. You can't have peace when you've got bitterness. You can't have joy, long-suffering, patience when there's bitterness. And you say, well, where does this bitterness begin? I mean, how did it start? It started as everything. It started as all sin in the heart of Satan. So here's the devil, Lucifer. He's the most amazing angel in the universe that God made. The Bible says he's filled with pipes and drums and organs and music and, and, he's, and gems and gold and topaz. And he's amazing. And he's, like the, he's just like, he's like amazing. And there he is uh, covering the throne of God and, 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 and worshiping, bringing, directing the worship to God. And it's amazing. But then the thought enters into his mind. Instead of thinking about all the stuff that God had given him, he began to think about the one thing God never gave him. How come I don't get some of this? Now, I'm, an, I'm amazing. I mean, look at me. I am amazing. And I should be, you know, a little bit of that worship, you know, honor could come my way. And, and bitterness entered into his heart. Yeah, right. And when you begin to focus and think about the one thing God never gave you, uh, well, well, you might have a lot of, I've, I've got that, but I haven't got that. And so what he does is uh, he defiles many and he's cast out of heaven because if you keep on wanting the one thing God hasn't given you, he, you lose even the thing he has given you. And so he's, he's cast out of heaven and he goes down to earth and he's looking around to see who else he can defile and he finds Adam and Eve. So he sneaks up, slithers, slithers up alongside and he says to Eve, he says, oh, you, you know, um, and actually Eve says, you know, we can, we can have anything that we like in the garden, just, just not that one. Ah, he says, Really? Oh, so, you know, why not? I mean, you should have that one thing. What is God doing holding one thing from you? How come you can't have that one thing? And she stopped looking at the thousand trees, banana trees, fruit trees, and mango trees, and every other tree that she had in the garden. And she looked at the one tree that God never gave her. Bitterness ended into her heart. And she took some and she ate and she gave it to her husband. And this story goes on through the Bible. Now, all the way, just about everybody's bitter about something. Because they're always wanting something that God never gave them. And it comes to Esau and Jacob, and here they are, the two boys at home. 
Esau's out hunting and, uh, and he's, the, he's the rugged New Zealand hunter and he's up there and he's he got nothing though. That's pretty typical. <coughs> I, I went hunting lots of times and I only shot two things in my life. And so anyway, so here he comes and he's, he's hungry and he's coming in. Here's Jacob, MKR, Israel. And he's got this beautiful feast going on there and uh, he looks at it and he smells it and he says, give me that feast. And he says, no, you're not going to have that feast. He says, oh, look, he says, I'll do anything. He says, all right, well, give me your birthright and you can have my feast. And so instead of, it's like he was the firstborn son, right? Loved by his father, twice as much property, twice as much riches, twice as much glory, twice as much honour. He was the firstborn son and he said, you know, uh, but I, I know I've got all of that. I, I know I'm blessed eternally. I know that I'm in the, you know, the annals of God's history book. I know I've got all of that, but I haven't got a stew. That's what the devil does. You might have all of that. You'd be, you'd be married for 40 years, but you don't have that. In the moment. So anyway, he gets better. He takes that. And uh, his life turns into a disaster. And bitterness continues on. Bitterness pops up all the way through the Bible. We get to Ruth. Here's Naomi. She's gone down. Sometimes we don't even know we're bitter. But here's Ruth. She's gone down to the to the to the to the to the to Moab. She's taken her f- husband, and she's gone with her husband and her two sons, and they married a woman down there in Moab because it was a famine. But while she's down there, of course, the husband dies, and then the two sons dies, and she's left alone with her uh, with her with her daughter daughters-in-law, and it, she began to think about. All the things now that she never had, that everybody else in, a, in, in Moab seems to have. I and mean, every other mother's got a, a son and, and her sons haven't been killed. And how come she's, he's got a, she's got a husband and my husband's gone? And she began to think about all the things that she didn't have now that everybody else seems to have. And she began to get bitter. And she says to her girl, she says, it makes me bitter for your sakes that God has gone out against me. Difficult circumstances. And then there's... Loss and failed expectations. Job is sitting there and he's lost his sheep and he's lost his camels and he's lost his cows and he's lost his kids and they've all been stripped away. And you can say, you know, yeah, okay, that's a good excuse to be bitter. He says, I will speak in the anguish of my spirit and I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Because this guy, he wasn't just a good man. He was a perfect man. He was always praying for his kids. He believed the best for his kids. Every day, the Bible says, Job offered prayers for his kids, lest they committed some little sin in their heart. And so he was a great father, the best father, a good father. And he loved those kids and he had great plans for those kids. And in a day, they were gone. Cows gone, kids gone, family gone, business gone, all gone. And he began to look at all the others that didn't go to church and they didn't love God like I did and they didn't put the pray- they never gave a, a you know at the temple like I did and they look- and he looked at his own life and he looked at those who were just rat bags and yet their life was blessed bitterness began to enter into his heart and then there are things we wanted but we never got and things we thought we should have and things that we thought we needed in life and how come we didn't like like, like Hannah. So she's in bitterness of soul and she prays unto the Lord. She weeps sore because she's not able to have children. And she looked at all the other mothers at the temple holding babies and nursing them and putting them to bed. And she thought, well, you know, everybody else has got a child. And everybody else as well. Everybody else has got a father. Everybody else hasn't got cancer. Everybody else hasn't got sick. How come I've got this? Sometimes we get bitter pain from close people in our life. Rebecca and Isaac, they were bitter. They were a bitterness of mind. This is Esau's wives. Esau's wives. The choice he made to marry heathen wives just made her bitter, just made us, just made her angry. Everything they looked at, everything they did, every way they cooked, every way they walked, it just made them angry. Because she was bitter inside. The Bible says a, a, a foolish son is a grief to his father and bitterness to her that bore him. You know, sometimes the behavior of our children can cause us pain, bitterness, the way they haven't treated us, the way they have treated us, the way they've ignored us. You know, I've, I, I speak to people. What happens to our children, choices they make, things that happen to children, grandchildren. I've spoke to people who've been Christians 30 years. 
And I said it in the first service, you know, when you're a Christian, two years, there's a good chance everything's going to go great because not much can happen in two years. But you'd be a Christian for 30 years and you raise kids and they get married and they have grandkids. And I've spoken to so many people that have been Christians 30 or 40 years and they say to me, I just never saw it coming. We raised our kids like this and we raised our kids the best we could and we did all we could for them. We can't think of anything better and look what they've done. Look at the choices they've made and we can't believe it and difficult comes and this one gets sick and this one's got some disease and, 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 and so the, the things that happen to people that are close to us can sometimes, if we're not careful, cause bitterness as well. And so what does it do? Sometimes we don't know we're bitterness. We, we're bitter. We don't want to think about it. We, don't want to, we can't wrestle with it. We love God, so we don't want to think about what, a, you know, we, don't, we push it down. We'd rather not go there. We don't want to think about the pain in life, and so we, we push it down. But the problem is with that is it begins to defile us in lots of ways. The first thing it does, it defiles the way we look at life. It defiles, it defiles the, you know, the, the, the very way we look at life differently to everybody else. So here's Israel. Israel's coming out of Egypt and they've had a bitter life, a cruel life, a hard mask. They've had a, ta- a tough life in Egypt and they've been ripped and they've been cruel and all they saw of leadership and all they saw of society was bitterness and cruelty and oppression and misery. And so they had this in their mind and so even when they come out of Egypt, they have a mindset and a judgment that life is going to be bad. Life is going to be tough. And so they come, God's delivering them. God's giving miracles to them. God's there in the fire on the bush. God's there in amazing ways. But when they see a red sea, oh, they're going to die. And now we're getting a little bit hungry because we're going out into the wilderness. We're going to die. And yet God had a plan. God always has a plan. More miracles. But you see, when you're bitter, what happens is you can't see miracles. You can only see through your hurt instead of your hopes. Joseph had the same problem. Joseph was, was, was treated really, really badly. Hated by his brothers, sold off as a slave, falsely accused, thrown into a prison, 17 years. But at the end, when it all comes together with the, son, with the brothers, he says, you guys meant it for evil. Yeah. Oh, but God, but God meant it for good. God, I, don't go, I haven't gone through anything in my life. No bitterness, no, no, no accusations, no selling off as a slave, no hardness, no, no being... I haven't gone through anything in my life that wasn't necessary for my destiny. I haven't gone. God has not put me through anything that hasn't enabled me to get ready for my future. There's nothing that God would let me go through and take me through that wasn't necessary for me to find my best life. Because he looked through his hopes. Second thing it does, it defiles our relationship with people. And with God. We find it hard to believe that God would want something good for us. We find it hard when you're bitter just to believe that God is going to have miraculous power revealed on our behalf, that nothing really good is going to happen, that nothing has really get changed because when you've got bitterness inside, you just really find it hard to think that anything good is going to happen. So, we, we, so, we, so, so, so bitter people hold back from their commitments. They aren't too sure really whether God is going to keep them on, the water, on top of the water. They hold back from their... their from making uh, steps of faith and and trust because they're not sure that God is actually going to come through. And so it hinders their life from becoming fruitful. And so it hinders them from doing. Because why? Because they're offended at God. Really, this is what it boils down to. Like the devil. I'm just disappointed. We call it disappointment. We call it, we call it, we call it lots of things. But you see, the thing is that when you start, when your hands start hanging down, and your knees don't get bent as much as they used to, and you really aren't in tune with God. You begin to drift a little bit away from God. You stop abiding in God, and ultimately you stop being fruitful. And then it affects our relationship with people. I mean, it's like in a marriage, you know, you get offended at your wife because she burnt the toast or something. Uh, you know, you get offended out of what happens. You begin to withdraw your heart. You withdraw your heart, it gets worse, you're living in two rooms. No chance of fruitful now. I don't know where that came from. Anyway, the first service never heard that. Okay. And so, anyway, the second thing it does is it defiles, the third thing, it defiles our emotions. You know, the counselors tell us this that the underwriting cause for just about all depression is bitterness. Now, I know there's chemical 
you know, sort of other uh, reasons for depression. But if it's just a good old-fashioned going through hard times of life depression, bitterness and resentment, holding grudges is number one cause for depression. You know, it defiles our judgment and our choices because all you're doing is thinking about the one thing you could have had or should have had. If I had that, if I had that, I'm pretty sure I'd be happy. And so you see a lot of people driving around in the thing they thought they needed to be happy. Or watching the 56-inch screen that they thought would make them happy. Or married to the third wife who they thought might make them happy. And so they're just thinking, you know what, if I, because why are they saying that? Why? Why? Because they're thinking that God hasn't given them what they need to be happy. But they, they think somehow that God has it holding back from me things in life that I need to be happy. Well, you know, you've got to define happy. God doesn't want us happy. He wants us holy. He doesn't give us what we want. He gives us what we need. He's trying to raise up some people that have got the life and the fruit and the character of Jesus Christ upon the earth. And so you might not have a TV, but you will have some character. You might not have a Porsche, but you might have some power. So it defiles our judgment and our choices. We can't celebrate with anybody else. Oh, you got a promotion? Oh, praise God. But you go away. Well, how come you got a promotion? I've never really got a promotion. I mean, you've been working at the same company for 10 years. I mean, I've been with him for years. Now he's the boss. Oh, it's bitterness. But I'm looking, I know I've got all this. I know I've got a job. I don't know I've got a wife and I know I've got a house and I know I've got a car and I know I've got, but, but I haven't got that. God's holding that out on me. And lastly, it defiles other people. Psalm says this, they sharpen their tongue like a sword. They bend their bows, they shoot their arrows and bitter words. See, a sharp tongue means there's bitterness in the heart. You know, we can come to church and we can say, Oh, holy art thou, you're amazing, you're amazing, I'm full of love, peace, joy. And then we go down the road and someone's at the lights, you clown, you just an idiot. And, and, uh, and, that, and that's just to the wife, I'm talking about that. <laughs> uh, you know, and then I start on the person who's actually doing the stuff down there. <laughs> no, no, I'm being silly. And so anyway, but you see, there's bitterness in the heart. Bitterness, bitterness in the heart. I mean, we don't, we don't get a sword and literally, you know, hack them down. But the Bible says that our tongue is like a sword. When you speak like that to somebody, it, it hurts them. It wounds them. It's true. It's real. So anyway, we're going to get out of this. We've got to get rid of our roots. And uh, so how do we do this? It's not too difficult. We want, to get, we want to get rid of it. We want to confess it. We want to renounce it. We want to get washed in that wonderful blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all sin. Without a trace of sin and defilement left. The first thing we've got to know is this. Hebrews says this. Now, no chastening for the present seems joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Jesus is saying, Paul is saying, if you're going to produce fruit, there has to be some chastening, some discipline. And when I was a kid, when I disobeyed dad at the cow shed, he'd come back up into the house and grab that apple tree thing that had just grown a new shoot and come in and search for his disobedient son. Okay, and so I had this idea of what chastening is, but that's not really a good idea of discipline. I mean, it's, it's okay, but a better one is this. Why is he doing what he's doing? If he's doing it because he's angry, that's punishment. But if he's doing it to make me a better gym, that's discipline. So he says, I'm going to bring stuff into your life that you didn't want but it's going to help you become your best you. And, not, and so discipline is two things. The, the coach gives us what we need, which we never thought we wanted, which we didn't want, but he gives us what we need. Run around the block 10 times. Or he takes from us the things we think we really need or we really want, but he knows won't help us become our best you. In other words, he's doing everything the opposite of what the devil gets bitter about. He gives us what we don't want, but it's good for us. And he takes away the things that aren't good for us, but really are. The devil flips it the other way and says, oh, you need that. And yeah, he's taken away something that you need. No, you don't. If you need it, he'll give it. So discipline is taking from our life the things we don't need to become like Jesus and putting into our life, if necessary, some difficult times in order for us to become 
like Christ. Knowing that is critical. The reason He does this, it's not about an easy life. It's about becoming like Christ. You know, discipline produces fruit. That's what a parent does. There are some things that God has to cut off from our life for us to be able to grow to the place where we can bear much fruit. He does it because He wants a fruit. He wants a testimony. He wants maturity of sons and daughters. <clears throat> and all of us nod. I know you get it. Yeah, I get, you get that with your heart, with your head. I know you do. And all of us would rejoice in discipline if only we could see the end, the peaceable fruit of righteousness. The thing about faith is you have to rejoice and believe in discipline before you see the fruit. You have to say, my God, I don't know why this is happening, but I know who's making it happen or allowing it to happen. And I know it's going to be good for me. I can't see how this is going to help me, but I know it will. It's being able to say, okay, I'm going to embrace discipline. I'm going to, I can, I can, you know, I can get through this. See, Naomi, Naomi, when she went through her difficult times, she said, I can't see how this is helping my life in any way. I can't see where God is. I don't think He's faithful. I don't think He's uh, helpful. I don't, I don't know where God is. My husband dies. I'm left alone. I'm a widow. There's no food. Now two sons have died. Who can make some money? There's nobody. And as she looked around, she couldn't see any reason why these things needed to happen in her life. I'm a child of God. I belong to God. But she didn't realize God was working when she thought He wasn't. She couldn't believe that God's faithfulness could be working out through her pain. Who can believe that? She didn't know that her present difficult circumstances reflected God's faithfulness, not His failure. But you haven't lived long enough to know that, Joseph. She didn't realize that when she came back to Bethlehem, God's plan, God's always got a plan. God's plan was, which she never knew, but when she came back, she realized God's plan, which would never have happened apart from that, was that she would, through Ruth, be grafted in to the olive tree of the Messianic believers and become eternally fruitful for God. She's up there rejoicing. But she didn't know that at the start. We don't know that. Sometimes we'll never see God's faithfulness worked out in our present or our near future. Sometimes it's 17 years like Joseph. But God gave her what she needed. Oh, I didn't know I needed that. And if you gave me the choice, Lord, I might have said no. It's amazing how God gives us what we don't want. But you see, she got what she needed and ultimately what she wanted, not by having the life she thought would make her happy, but so God could give her the life that would give her meaning, purpose, fruit, eternity. And sometimes we aren't clever enough to make the right choice. So He does it for us. He's a great coach. He's a great father. Never judge your present or God's faithfulness by your presence nor even your distant future. You know, sometimes we've got to go through things to become the vessel, the person. See, God has a, a moment for you. God has a moment for your kids, a, a moment for your relatives, a moment for your business. And sometimes we think, well, I, I know when the moment is. Have any of you seen Candace Brown, that lady from America? She's a, she's a black lady. She's pretty young. But she's got a great testimony. And I think she's does the does round speaking now, whatever. But uh, she, she sort of came up in the race riots and stuff. And she said, you know what? She said, the message I carry, and she's got a great message. She says, I wouldn't have had that message. If I hadn't known abuse, if I hadn't known poverty, if I hadn't known the, the, the whatever, and she went through the list of all the stuff she went through. And then she says, but I haven't come out as a victim. She says, I'm carrying a message of hope and change of what you can be, not because of your past, but because of your choices you make. It's a great speech. I don't know whether she's a Christian, but it's a great speech. But the point is this. She said her message she carried was from the mess that she went through. I think I've told you this before, but Augustine's mother, she prayed and prayed, God, make him a man of God when, she, when he lived in Egypt. When he became an adult, 
Augustine said, Mom, I'm going to Rome. She said, oh, please don't go to Rome. Please don't go to Rome. It's a cesspit. He said, oh, I'm going anyway. So he goes off to Rome and sure enough becomes the the range defiled with madness and sin. But then he met the Lord. And all the message he carried was a message of hope and cleansing and the blood and and the healing and the mercy and the grace of God which swept through the earth. You see, sometimes God has a moment and sometimes it says, well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's, what's happening in all of that. But you see, you've got to give God a chance to work for His moment. When it's time to bring forth a person with a message, God is always working. A couple of weeks ago, we were sitting here, and we are closing. A couple of weeks ago, we were sitting here, and uh, Pastor Stephen was leading us, and we're singing this song. Uh, I'm known you as a father, I've known you as a friend. <clears throat> and I'm known your goodness every day of my life. I felt a little twinge and I just felt Holy Spirit, my mind, who knows. Say, you know what? There are people that find that hard to sing. Because when they look at their life, they don't see every day. They can't see the goodness of God every day. Oh, they might believe it in their mind, but they're still thinking of the way their child was abused, or they're thinking the way that their relative died in a crash, or they're thinking the way that their prayer was not answered, and that they had trouble, and they're in poverty stricken and lost their job for five years. They're still thinking of pain, and they find it hard to think the goodness of God was following me all the days of my life. And yet it's, and yet it's true. It's the goodness of God was following Naomi all the days of her life. Oh, I just can't see it, and you can't see it, friend. The goodness of God was following Israel. They came to the sea and it looked like they're going to die and they're running out of food and it looks like they're going to die. But the goodness of God was following them. And now they get a miracle and now the sea opens. You just have to wait a little while. And the goodness of God catches up with us. It may be a year, it may be five years, maybe 10. See, his times are not the same as our times. But I want us to get to the stage, and I believe the Holy Spirit wants us to get to the stage today where we can settle our faith in His faithfulness. Because it's impossible to be full of faith when you aren't convinced of His faithfulness. I want us, as we end, I want us to be able to say, you know what, in faith, I don't know why this was necessary in my life, but I just know my Father. I don't know why this, I I don't know how this is going to work out. I don't know how this works out. I just believe that the Bible says everything works together for good to those that love God. I I don't know why I couldn't, I don't know why I couldn't have that in my life. I I don't know why I couldn't, I, I don't know why I had to have that in my life. But God does. And God's bringing forth something good out of it. That's where I think we, God wants us to come to today. Fullness of faith from believing in His faithfulness. Because if we don't, what happens is <clears throat> we, just, we just stay bitter. You can call it what you like. You can say, oh, yeah, it's just things I don't know and things I don't understand. I'm disappointed and yeah, life's been hard. And you call it what you like. But if it's not fullness of faith and confidence, and gratitude for His faithfulness in your life, it's, it's still bitterness. And so the Bible tells us in Hebrews what to do. We need to know the Father's goal. Settle that. It's not painless living. It's to become like Christ. That's the goal. The next thing is this. Hebrews says this, but therefore lift up holy hands. You know, when you start becoming bitter, we just, we're just dropping our hands. God, I'm not sure that I can... Really, really just say, you're amazing all of the days of my life. I'm just, I'm just not sure about that. But he wants us to get to the stage where we can worship him abandon again and say, Lord, I believe it. I believe you're, I believe you're faithful. I just, I just believe that you are, 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 are being, bringing good things into my life. And then we've got to make some healing choices. We've got to reclaim our fruitfulness. It says, make straight paths for your feet, lest, there, lest what is lame be turned out of the way, but rather let it be healed. Friend, if we aren't healed, 
you become turned out of the way. I know plenty. I know plenty. We're making decisions based on what we can't understand instead of decisions upon what the Word of God declares. If you've got to doubt something, we never doubt God. We doubt our understanding. The love of God is beyond our understanding. We trust in that. And so we're going to just make some healing choices. We're going to get right with man. The Bible says, follow peace with all men. God wants to heal us. We can't afford to harbor resentment, bitterness, unforgiveness, a husband against a wife, against a father and mother, an older brother or a sister, an uncle or teacher. It doesn't matter what it is. We can't afford, because here's the thing, if we don't get rid of that slimy, creeping, vine root of bitterness, it will squeeze the life of the root of Christ out of our life. We don't be, you can't be, you can't have the fruit of joy when you're still struggling with bitterness. We can't have the fruit of peace, of patience, of kindness, goodness. When there's bitterness in our life, God wants us to be, to be fruitful. All right. What we're going to do is, and then it goes on, it says, you know, uh, decide to forgive, peace with men, what's next? And holiness, that's peace with God. Peace with God. Being at peace about what God's done in your life. In every place, every place, I'm at peace with that. You're wiser than me. You're bigger than me. You're amazing, more amazing than me. And then we're going to receive grace. So last slide. And while we're just in his presence, let's work through this this morning. You know, God, the Holy Spirit is here just to remove every root from every life because he wants us fruitful. He wants us fruitful. So what we're going to do is get rid of every bitter root and the root of Christ will begin to produce fruit absolutely and automatically. So I want you to think about anything that's come to mind and what we're going to do is we're going to just work through this. We're going to confess our bitterness towards God for lack. Maybe you had lack in your life. Maybe you've gone through hard times, hard circumstances, things you never wanted to happen in life. You can't believe that happened. Experiences, bitter people. We're going to renounce and reject it. All bitter judgments against people. You've got to reject every bit of judgment you make. Or a judgment would begin to touch your life. Thanks for joining us for this week's message. If you'd like to find out more about Manukau New Life Church, be sure to check out the link in the description about our church website and our church app. Have an awesome week. See you guys next week.